Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Stephanie and I'll be your host today. Today we will discuss how to leverage behavioral analytics to reduce insider threat. The session will cover best practices for security monitoring through logs, insights from top cybersecurity incidents and why the attackers remain undetected, and examples of how machine learning and user behavioral analytics can minimize insider threats. Before we get started, I want to review a few housekeeping items and let you know how you can participate in today's session. You have joined today's webinar listening through your computer speaker system by default. If you would like to call in using the phone, just locate your audio pane and select Fuse Telephone. The dial-in information and access code will then be displayed. You also have the ability to ask questions using your questions pane. Simply type in your question and click Send. At the end of the presentation, we will do a Q&A session and take as many questions as we have time for. At this time, I would like to introduce today's featured speaker, Barry Steinman. As a seasoned information security expert and cybersecurity technology evangelist, Barry leads the threat research team here at Exabeam. Prior to Exabeam, Barry led worldwide public security research as the director of security at Imperva, where he provided vital support for the CTO office. Barry authored the Hulk DDoS attack tool and has several patents in his name. Now, without further ado, let's turn the time over to Barry. Thank you, Stephanie, uh, and good morning, everyone. Um, today, we're going to go through uh, um, essentially how to use uh, all of the signals that we have in our enterprise in order to capture insider threats or uh, better improve our ability to detect insider threats and other threats that are imminent on our networks. To do that, I want to go through the, some baseline of how uh, currently uh, the best practice is to capture uh, signals on the network. The main thing that we see, and, and it's kind of an ongoing thing, which is usually the risk department or the CISO office will ask us to uh, gather information. So they will, what they will do is they will say, I have a new thesis, I have a new uh, line of sight that I need to, to, to look at, I need, more, I need signals that that help me understand a specific problem. And they will go to the security team and ask them, all right, we need to find a, a product or some sort that can leverage that signal or detect that signal. So, you know, if it's processes or, or something like that, it might be a carbon black or similar. If it's malware, you might go for, to a FireEye or similar. And if it's like access logs, you, you go to VPN, Windows, or what have you. All of these events are then usually poured from the from, from the detection or monitoring device and are poured into a, a, an LMS, a log management system such as a SIM, where eventually the security analyst team or the SOC uh, uh, will go to in order to find uh, incidents to understand what's ha what's going on if there's a case of a breach uh, and they can det and that will be where uh, all of the all of the repositories are thrown into in order to start uh, the uh, the triage and understanding the timeline of what happened. If we look at, at all of the requirements for monitoring that we just uh, uh, time that the CISO office comes and says, uh, I need uh, to detect uh, a use case. So I need to monitor, and I just mentioned a few like lateral movement, remote employees monitoring maybe exfiltration and obviously the, the common, you know, malicious activity, malware, ransomware, whatever have you, uh, that is trending. Uh, each time that, you, that, that uh, a use case is being created, then the security team needs to understand what are the relevant signals that we need to detect, what are products that help us detect that. And that creates a, a pile of logs that, that then needs to be tracked and monitored in order to understand what's going on. Uh, later, if we look at how an analyst works today, and this is uh, what, I, what I hear from every SOC team that I work with today, is that essentially they look at it as a stash of logs and maybe they have like a cool tool on top of the stash of logs to help them uh, query or they can run different, uh, different uh, uh, correlation rules that help them to, you know, throw things that they already know and expect uh, in front of them to say this might mean something. And when something happens, uh, they will go to, will go to these uh, uh, triggered uh, rules or triggered um, correlation rules or alerts, and then they will create incidents from them and go to, to, to look into them. So, for example, uh, if I get an alert that says uh, severity very high and, and it's a FireEye malware or something, maybe it says Loki in it or something like that, uh, 
the analyst's job is then to to act on containment as well with the security team as well as investigation which means now I need to grab all of the evidence of how all of this started uh, I need to build a, a, a timeline and, and start digging through in order to be able to explain what happened so in essence the analyst's job is to not not only track everything but then also build uh, the evidence uh, or the forensic chain to say uh, if we need to follow up on this, this is what happened, and this is what I should then explain to the CISO, which then sometimes have to also explain to the board, or unfortunately sometimes it goes even beyond the board when something really, really bad happens. Um, to make this a bit more, more uh, uh, familiar to everyone, what I'd like to do is I'd like to, to tie this to uh, incidents that, w that we've seen. In a, I, I chose to pick uh, incidents that have been very, very common and very, very well known. So uh, I wanted to take the, the, the main incidents that everybody by now have seen. If you're in security, you know about these things. But maybe look at them from a bit of a different angle of what happens with the security analyst. So the first one, very common, as you know, and, and I think this will be a common use case forever. Everybody wants to relate to this, target. So at Target, if you remember Thanksgiving uh, slash Christmas 2013, uh, 40 million credit cards and personal information items were stolen through uh, what eventually I think uh, I think was a, like an HVAC vendor, and there was an infection there of malware to point of sale. It doesn't the details don't really matter, uh, at least not for us at this stage, because what we know is that there were alerts from from uh, security uh, uh, signals such as FireEye and others. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, human error. Uh, the, the, maybe there were too many alerts, and they, maybe the severity was medium, or maybe if it was high, but it looked similar to, you know, the human eye that says, "I think I've seen this, and this is nothing." Um, and essentially, what happened was that these alerts were ignored, or, or someone said, oh, I, "I see these every day. I should, I, there's no, there's no reason to act on it," which is often the case. And as we know, eventually, this led to a CEO leaving, a, a lawsuit. Uh, um, uh, I think there was a, there was a financial reimbursement from uh, from um, uh, how do you call those? Uh, never mind. Insurance companies. Yes, that's what I was looking for. Sorry. Um, and essentially, it, this this incident is a pure human error of misinterpreting a signal or ignoring a signal by fatigue or just by not misinterpreting what what's on screen. Next, again, very very common, very very well known. Uh, the Neiman Marcus case, where 1.1 million uh, credit cards uh, were exposed. Now, Neiman Marcus was actually in a, very, in a fairly good state if I compare it to some of the other uh, organizations that we looked at. Uh, I went and took a, a report from Dambala, uh, at, uh, the Dambala Infections Report of 2014, and I looked at, the, at it because they actually did an analysis on, Le on Neiman Marcus wh where they said that Neiman Marcus has 60,000 events a day uh, that are just security alerts. Now, if you look at, at the, the numbers above that, the average enterprise also has about 160 million to 200 million events that are not necessarily security events, like, such as Windows logs, etc. Finding something in that noise is very difficult. So, there's a, the, the, they had a, an issue where, even though they had all of the right products in, in place, they had all of the security products that send them the alerts, hey, there's, this is malware, this is access, so, to detect the signal, the signal and all of that noise and essentially they, they just missed the right alert. They couldn't find the, what, uh, the right thing that happened and, the, and, and unfortunately it also happened over, over uh, three months. So you can imagine that the, the time doesn't help you here. And you can say uh, something like, all right, I can, I can just throw more people at this problem, but realistically how many alerts can a human eye look at when it's flowing in a day and what's the relevance and expertise that you need in order to do that? It's a bit impossible. And last one, and I, I think I can't try the slide deck without without mentioning Snowden nowadays. I think it's it's just impossible. But Snowden is kind of the 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 most clear case of an insider threat uh, that we all know about. And for those of you who don't know all of the details, so Snowden used to be an administrator in the NSA, um, which means he just had access. He had access to data uh, to sensitive data all over the place. And unfortunately, when you're looking at administrators and companies or as uh, privileged users, let's say executives, etc., 
sometimes you you just don't know how to differentiate the good from the bad uh, or the bad from the good. How do I know that an administrator touching a, a database uh, that he that is, is that an anomaly? Is that something that's that's wrong for that user to do? It's very weird, and it's uh, that even though we have all of these privileges monitoring tools, uh, we can't really say is this something that this user should do or has done before, etc. Uh, and that goes to data to data flows. It, it it connects to what what files uh, Snowden actually touched and downloaded, etc. All of those to the you know to the untrained eye and even to the very trained eye of the NSA, just seem maybe as as normal. He's that's his job, and and that's how uh, there was just no detection that caught Snowden. Only and, and only when he actually did his uh, how did he call it whistleblowing thing. That's when that's when uh, uh, everybody uh, uh, started doing forensics evidence gathering and figured out all right this is what he's done, but at no point in time there was anything that flagged and said this is wrong we should stop the guy while it's happening there was no detection. So <laughs> my favorite picture uh, uh, and unfortunately it kind of resonates with these three examples. Uh, this is how some some of the socks look like uh, because of alert fatigue. Uh, you miss incidents, so clearly target. The signal to noise ratio is sometimes unmanageable. Uh, clearly, even Marcus, 60,000 alerts a day? Uh, yes, it, it goes beyond human. And then when you look at users that just look like other users uh, or they don't do anything that raises a, an immediate uh, suspicion, like they don't use hacking tools, they just go and download a file, it just goes undetected because it just looks normal. Now there are ways to deal with these things, um, and sorry, I wrote the slide deck back in the day when the, when my, one of my favorite movies came out. So apologies for the title. Um, when you actually go and, and try to trace what happens in the sim, one of the things you do is you start gathering uh, you start gathering evidence, and when you gather evidence, you start thinking about all right. So if I got an alert from let's let's just use FireEye as an example, if I take an alert at Fire on FireEye. Uh, I may have the user, I may not, but I start looking at all of the all of the items, the IP addresses, the users, the host names, uh, what kind of an alert it was, and then I I have to go as an analyst beyond just that alert. I need to go to the devices that were touched, the, the networks, the the assets, uh, and then I'm trying to build a timeline, right? So I, so my job is to then get all of those logs, the Windows logs, all of the activity of the user and of the assets and how they pivoted which other users use that same machine and it becomes a big story. And if you have ever seen an incident response management system, you see that it always contains like tons of logs, gigabytes of logs and gigabytes of memory dumps just to understand what really happened or to keep the forensic evidence aside. But at the end, it's really a pile of logs. Whatever we just did was to pull everything that we already have and just make it meaningful, which is kind of a shame because one of the main investments that we have today in security is as as SIM as, L, as the LMS log management system where we collect everything and we and we really want to get the, the most out of that and make sure that it's meaningful when th something happens, not when we want to go back and gather stuff from it. So, what we did with it, and and here I'm I'm kind of going to our technology and and and, and what we can do with this, and to be honest, a lot of a lot of our uh, of uh, other companies that are are playing in the UEBA space. Are kind of going after the, uh, some of these uh, techniques, maybe different techniques. Uh, obviously, some of this, uh, for example, this specific slide, that's that's a patented approach. But uh, th there are many techniques to do this, and I'm going to describe ours. So, what we did is we used a, a very a very well known uh, mathematical paradigm called the connection graph. What the connection graph is essentially, and I'll try to keep it brief, is is my ability to connect two dots. With a vector based on a similar a similar attribute. So, for example, two uh, computers can be tied by the fact that they had the same username uh, uh, between them. So, the same user was active on, on one and then went to the other. That's a good way to to create a path. And then each of each one of these objects has its own um, has its own other attributes. So, the connection graph is kind of an on, of, of of an organism that grows by all of the connection between. The different objects that that are tied together, uh, a user can connect to a network. Network may have more users on it, may have more devices, and so forth. And and essentially, when you when you uh, create an abstract on top of that, you then create what we call a session, an activity session. 
So by looking at, at the, the, the timeline that we build and seeing what happened after what, we can build the user's timeline in a very clear way to, uh, to explain what the, what the user has done in the day. And this is built in real time. So when a user is, is accessing VPN, the VPN device sends a log, which is immediately available, and then uh, uh, you know a UBA, a UBA product such as Exabeam can immediately say, right, user just logged into to VPN. He now has an active session. He's now doing something. Let's track him. Um, so in this case, it's very clear, right? You see the user connected from VPN to a computer. From it, he went to, onto a network and a storage device. On that storage device, there was some sort of an alert. And then he went from that to a server, activated a, a, an application, and eventually touched a file. Um, I'm going to stop here for a second because one of the things that I keep hearing whenever we talk to, uh, to uh, uh, SOC managers and analysts about this, they all say the same thing, especially forensics, forensics uh, or DFIR general uh, uh, practitioners. They all say, by this time, you've already solved a lot of our pain. Just b building the timeline that tells me the chain of, of activity of what the user did in that day is already enough for doing some work in understanding what happened. But we don't want to stop there because once we've, w once we've gathered the connection graph and we know how a user is behaving, the smart thing is now to say, all right, as, I mean, a user or an analyst will not know if it was... Uh, if it was if there was a threat involved or anything like that, we should be able to give them that. So that's where we apply uh, machine learning in order to provide uh, you know a data science approach to what's what's good and what's not. How do we do that? So in front of you, uh, you see uh, on the on the right side of the screen, you see a histogram, and that histogram is a very simple uh, way to to uh, to explain uh, like the most basic model of activity. What we see here is for a specific user, in this case we call her Barbara, uh, we see all of the all of the uh, countries that that user is connecting to. So and, and so every time that the user connects from a country, you know the the a new bin or a new um, item in the in the histogram is being created with a counter. How many times that user has come from this country? And by setting a threshold on, on top of all of, that, of all of that data, we are now able to ask meaningful questions. For example, if I know that Barbara always connected from, like the majority of connections that Barbara is doing are from Germany, Canada, and United States from VPN, I know that it's normal for her to do it from these countries. So I will not raise any risk, I will not say anything, because for me, I know that that's the normal behavior. Ukraine in this case is kind of borderline. I mean, I can claim that she's on the that she's on the, the right on the threshold that might indicate that all right, this is a bit of abnormal for her to come from there. She she did connect from Ukraine, but it's not trivial for her. That that and China in this case is very much uh, an outlier. We can definitely see that she only connected once before in China, and that might have been an, uh, uh, a problematic login or just uh, you know a, a false a false uh, authentication log, etc. But it only happened once, so that's definitely an anomaly for for a barber to come from China. On top of that, we can also see that barber never never connected to VPN from Brazil. To me, that's a clear indicator that that if she's do now doing it and she's never done it before, that's an outlier. That's something that I want to flag to my user. So if we take back all of the logic about about uh, the the uh, hold on, I, my slide is stuck. If we, if we take all of the uh, uh, connection graph that we talked about earlier and we start looking at all of the, uh, and all of the anomalies based on, uh, on trained and learned, and learned data during, uh, over time, we can find all of, all of the things that the user is doing that he, should, that he normally does not or he normally does and then find out if a user is doing something that is, uh, that is a bit weird for, him, for them. Maybe compare them to their peers, to their organization. Uh, compare them to other employees that work under the same manager to see if they're doing the same thing. And that's, and that's kind of how detection starts, by comparing all of these, uh, all of these uh, uh, data points over time. Uh, clearly, from this example, you can understand how easy it is to look at, at someone like Snowden and figuring out, all right, so he, he, he might be an administrator, but he's doing some things differently than others. He's touching assets. 
uh, he's downloading a file that no one's ever downloaded before and took it out of the system and stuff like that. So just to give you like a, a really high level uh, look at some of the things that can be asked, I really cherry picked a few here that seemed that seemed uh, nice to show on the screen. But for each item in the in the session we just talked about before, we can ask times of set of questions. I can ask who is this user in the company? If it's an executive, for example, how weird is it if if uh, if you see a user that has that is uh, accessing normally his own laptop, and all of a sudden he's touching the CEO's laptop or uh, one of the other executives, because that's not his machine. Um, how how when does the user normally come in from VPN versus other uh, connections? Is he a common? Is he a traveler for the company? Is he a let's say a sales representative that you expect to travel all over the place, or is he a developer that you would expect to be 90% of the time or more in the office? And it's very weird that all of a sudden he's working on code when he's at home. And we can ask tons of questions such as where are you coming from? Which ISP? Which countries? Are you coming from like a tour exit point, uh, or any other thing that I can that I can infer by by adding a threat into it on top of things? Uh, have, are, have you used this computer before? Have you touched this server before? And I've, we've we again we know all of these things by applying that that model that we talked about earlier. And we have, as you can imagine, there are many many techniques. I just chose uh, one technique to understand. What does a user uh, do, and how can I how can I train based on what the user is doing, and then infer for anomalies from it? So I'll jump to a few, uh, even alerts. I mean, and this is this is actually a very common question that I get asked: uh, is a is a like a malware alert always always a, a good signal to say something is bad is happening? And the answer is you know sometimes, um, but it it really uh, it really is important to understand the context of it. As we know, uh, if you know if someone in a, in a SOC sees uh, an alert that says uh, medium severity, they might just ignore it, or low severity, they just might ignore it. Versus high, and even high uh, might mean different things. But when you have when you apply a model to to an alert and you say, all right, this might be medium, but I've never seen this alert before in my company. That's a whole different context on, for that alert. And if I see a medium alert for something that that is a known malware, but you know. We see it every day, maybe, but hey, before that or after that alert, the user has touched a ton of, of new assets. Maybe we can see obvious lateral movement that we didn't expect to see, such as a user connecting to computers that are owned by other people, connecting to a server in, a, in the PCI zone that he's never accessed before, etc. That's meaningful. But if I take a, a very severe alert and I see it every day, maybe you know a, a misclassification, misclassification by an antivirus vendor that says that spyware is severity 10. That's fine if it's the first time you want to know about this. But over time, you want to decay that to say, all right, this is something that we see every every day. It's a toolbar. It's something that is is was interesting first, but now it's 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 less important. We want to be able to decay it by applying a model to that alert. Again, again, I mean more noise. So let's go back to the, the questions that we asked at the beginning. I mean, I've seen an alert firing on a, on a host. Can I just dismiss it? Can I, can I take the risk of being another target? Or if I get a, a ton of those, can I apply some meaning to this to, to actually extract something that will tell me this might be an insider problem, either malicious or infected or, you know, all of the types that, that are common? And how many um, how many of our analysts would analysts will actually dismiss alerts just because they, they think they're not, that they are not important? Now let's rethink this with the context of of, uh, of UEBA. This is how a session would look like for that user. So I've seen Barbara connecting. She connected from China, which is abnormal for her, and then she connected uh, to a network that she's never accessed before. No one in, in her peer group, and this is important, Barbara, let's say that she's from, uh, I don't know, HR. So if, if Barbara is in, is in HR and now she's touching the finance network or the PCI network or a server network that she's never accessed before, that might be weird. And then she normally reads several files on the storage uh, for, to do her work. Maybe she's using several applications to do that. But now she's accessing files, you know, in the sales folder, in the, in the financial reports folder, etc. And she's never done that before. Maybe that should should throw some more points to uh, to elevate the, the risk of what she's doing. And eventually, we see also some malware. So, 
imagine the timeline so far. Barbara is touching things and going places she's never gone to before, and then we see some hour. Maybe so. Maybe all of the session kind of dictates that Barbara being infected. And there's data exfiltration happening because malware is, is gathering things and sending it outside. That might be very, very weird. Now, the beautiful thing about a session is this, this is very easy for me to show to a, to a risk officer, to a forensics officer, to say, let's gather some, some the, the memory from this machine because that's what we've seen. It's very easy for me to pitch a risk incident to the CISO because now I understand the context. I see the timeline, I understand what, what, what were the anomalies, and then I can go and gather, you know, the Windows logs that were relevant, the, the VPN logs, the malware logs. Uh, maybe I want to combust that file that we've seen in, in a, like a, a sandbox and, and essentially get, shut down that, that laptop and understand what happened. But without this, it was only an alert. And if it was like a medium alert or a low alert, I would have just ignored it. And that, that insider problem would have just gone unnoticed. So for that, I think that's kind of the, the biggest uses of why do you need to correlate everything together and why you just can't let human do that. What you really want to do is let a machine build everything for you and that, let, then let a human read what we're seeing now on screen. Let me read the case. Let me read what actually happened and understand and infer from that, should I have a, 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 any followed action in my organization? With that, uh, we'll go to now to questions. I want to, uh, to give the session back to Stephanie for the Q&A session. Thank you, Stephanie. Great, thank you, Barry. We will go ahead and take some time for some questions now. Just a reminder, please be sure to type your questions into the question box in your GoToWebinar control plan panel. Okay, Barry, so we have our first question. What's the value add of UBA to an already experienced incident response team? Uh, hmm. So, even an experienced, even an experienced team, what what an exp sorry, so what, what an experienced incident response uh, team will do is they will immediately know what to gather, and they, and they will be able to see uh, an incident as it happens if they have seen this before. That's what experience means. I can act based on my past, but it doesn't let them understand things that are new, net new, or just happening for the first time. Um, and also, if you have really, really good and experienced team, what you want to do is you want to use them for the more valuable things. You want to make sure that, that the time that they spend is used in order to, to analyze the, the, the incidents that matter. So, so a UBA solution here will let them uh, look at the meaningful sessions, at the ones that actually, uh, that actually have some risk to them the ones that actually were flagged that they might have missed otherwise. And you want them to focus more on the, on the next level rather than on the, the immediate uh, detection. Um, okay. I think that's it. All right. Next question. Does Exabeam also address any behavior analysis, which is different from user, given the lack of Active Directory when monitoring machine to machine? Uh, the answer is yes. That's clear as that. Uh, uh, when you when you uh, think about the connection graph, the connection graph is pivoted. The pivot point might be a user, it might be an entity such as a, a device, it might be something else like a, I don't know a, a stream of some sort. But the general answer is yes. I, here it's very easy for me to show it from the user perspective because it's it's uh, it's very easy to uh, to explain it to to an audience. But you can you can do the same thing from from for a device. As this device. Uh, ever been accessed from uh, from users in this department? Has this device has ever been uh, touched from uh, or accessed from uh, users from uh, that connected from VPN? Has this computer uh, that is now a server ever had this service account uh, performing this activity versus a non-service account? Or uh, yeah, I mean that's kind of it. It's the the, gen the generic answer is yes. Okay, next question. How do you prevent false positives using a system like this? For example, Barbara is on vacation, and it's valid that she's working from her vacation, but it's in a different location. So first of all, if she's on vacation, one of the things that we do, uh, and it's, it's fairly clear, uh, you can take things like the vacation calendar from your organization and your HR. Uh, system information as well. Uh, it's, it's actually very common to take things like, you know, out of office messages or vacation calendars or HR watch lists such as users that should be on vacation uh, at, at certain dates, especially at banks where it's actually regulated that some users have to take vacations at certain dates. 
and then you want to track their activity. We actually had a, an, inter an interesting case a, a few months ago where we saw a user that, that connects from a country that uh, from their laptop but from a country that they never visited before and we flagged it even though it uh, I mean you could argue that that was that was a, a, a weird noise because you know the, the user was on vacation but the company policy itself was we don't want to uh, users to go to certain countries uh, with their with our computers because we don't trust encryption because they're just not allowed to take their, their uh, corporate assets other than maybe their phones when they're on vacation. So that was a good flag. So by correlating more signals, and again, the signal the signal path is, is indefinite. Anything that you can collect can be used here. Uh, if I say that we that you can look at, at users' attributes, the fact that the user has been disabled because he was fired a few months ago or just left, or is he's on notice because because uh, uh, like he's on PIP, uh, performance improvement plan because his manager said if you don't improve you're, you're out kind of things or they're simply on vacation uh, these things are usually tracked by uh, by large enterprises to know who's in and who's out and that's definitely a signal that can be applied to say is this is this risky or not when you look at, it, at the overall activity of the user okay next question how does XAB know what a user's peer is is that something that has to be configured manually yeah, so there, there are uh, several ways to do this. Uh, I'll, I'll explain the simple one, and I won't explain the one that is uh, uh, patent pending, I should say. Uh, so the simple one is uh, uh, you normally know from things like L uh, LDAP or your Active Directory or your IDM uh, which users report to which manager or which users work in the same department or which users do the same kind of job. And all of these techniques are, are techniques to understand uh, Sorry, all of these uh, data points are, are data points that explain uh, who are your peers. They are peers because you guys both uh, report to the same manager, or maybe the same department head, uh, or you do the same job, um, etc. So that's the that's kind of actual context around uh, around peer grouping. And then uh, there are ways to determine peer grouping uh, by by actually using data science algorithms that, to say these users have a distance of uh, like a, a certain distance of behavior. Uh, they do the same things in the same times on the same whatever. I, I'm trying to be vague here because it's kind of patent pending, and I'd rather not go into too much detail on a, on a public webinar if you don't mind. Uh, but I'm, I'm more than happy to have a one-on-one -on, -one on these kind of questions and explain it. Okay, um, let's move on to the next question. Can you comment on why some vendors list their product as UBA versus UEBA? Um, I think it's kind of more of a marketing thing. Uh, so the space started with UBA the, when 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 everybody uh, started talking about about applying you know uh, big data solutions and and, and uh, data science to to uh, the sim pro, to the sim premise of of log and signal analysis, uh, a lot of vendors said uh, uh, we we want to track user, uh, and that's how it started. Then uh, along came Gartner and said, all right, we don't want to call this uh, user only because there is the, the asset, the entity involved as well. So then Gartner defined it as instead of just saying user behavior analytics, it said user and entity behavior analytics. Um, now, most vendors, uh, you know, changed their, uh, their, uh, their material then to say UEBA or not. Um, I, I would say that if a vendor now only says UBA, it's just because they're now either just getting in here uh, or just getting into the space or or, or maybe they're just you know working with the space. There are a lot of vendors that uh, that have you know UEBA uh, 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 statements on their materials, but essentially they they integrate with a UBA vendor, or they uh, like there are a lot of vendors, for example, that work with us. Or we're the UEBA vendor, and a lot of vendors are sending us signals, and then they they say, All right, uh, if you want to do UBA or UEBA, uh, we can do this, and we partner with XB. Uh, so then you have like the, the marketing jargon about how do how do they state it because they're not necessarily uh, a direct path, a direct part of the of the space. But essentially, uh, U, UBA is like the old way to call it. Uh, UEBA that it also uh, states the the connection to the asset itself in this paradigm is the the new way to call it. So yes, I I think I answered uh, <laughs> extensively for a very short uh, <laughs> for a very short question. So sorry for that. Okay, let's move on to the next question. How does Exabeam differentiate from other UBA tools that already exist out there? Uh, so, okay, uh, so first of all, 
I'll, I'll try to be as nice as possible because I, I think you know everybody has a uh, has room here, and I definitely appreciate my uh, my competitors or I call them colleagues, but you know some people might smack me on the head for that. Um, everybody has their own good ideas, right? Um, so in UBI, I think what, like some of the things that are that make us a bit unique here is a we're very very agile. Um, I think I've seen how. Uh, again, I'm from the research arm from the, of the company, but I definitely see how the sales team executes and how the the field executes and how, how this, you know, the customer success and support teams execute. And, and it's very easy to see how fast we are with customers. Normally, normally within a few days, uh, uh, most of our of our POCs or or our uh, deals are already happening because the value was already uh, shown because of our of our real time analysis and our ability to to learn really really quickly from from integrating with every sim in the market, with being able to look at at, at most more signals than anyone else. And also, uh, we're fairly agile in, in doing things like, uh, you know, if you have your own application that is custom tailored that you built in your, in your home in your data center, we're very happy and excited to just add the immediate content that allows you to, to to observe that too. So that's kind of, of uh, of why it's so it's so like people like us because we're, at least again, I don't do the sales part, but but I definitely see how what customers are telling us back. Yeah, you guys were agile. You guys were fast. Uh, fairly fairly quick to to show us the the value in, in the product as well as also um, the fact that we're real time so we have a lot of benefits of showing things as they happen you know it's logs right so when you look at logs uh, logs are being sent uh, immediately when the event happens and what most platforms do in, in our space is they do post analysis at the end of day or something like that which is important we also have parts of our products to do this but when you want, but when you want early detection for cases like ransomware or malware, or uh, maybe someone is exfiltrating something, you want to know as it happens. And there is a benefit of the of, of the way that we do things, which is we look at things as they happen. The second we get the the, the log artifact and immediately doing a calculation, and then doing post post mortem calculations as well to say how was this abnormal from other things, etc. Uh, and eventually, uh, and I think more and more vendors have, have understood this. Uh, I think one of the things that we hit we hit on uh, great very early on was our concept of the connection graph in the session. Everybody uh, was showing you anomalies, and you know, uh, everybody would say the the hidden Markov model shows me this and that, blah blah blah. Uh, but eventually, what we did with the session by building a timeline was, and it's patented, uh, obviously. Uh, was was the greatest thing of all by tying all of this activity to the user or to the entity and by then showing what happened over time which is exactly what your analyst does in a SOC when they trace an incident uh, there are uh, you know there are uh, different techniques today that others are, are doing and I I'm not a legal guy so I just look at it as a compliment of course uh, to say if, if we've done it first and then everybody else is doing it then it means, it means we're doing it right um, so that's kind of the differentiator as I see. Plus, uh, and this is kind of a, you know a personal thing. Uh, I think we just have great people, it's, and it's very evident when people work with us. Uh, you know, when a customer calls the support center and asks to talk to research because they have an idea or they want to do something that they think that we can do better with them, uh, their phone call will land with me eventually, or with uh, you know the VP of product if it's something that they want to. To improve, so we're very we're very open about these things, and I think people just like to work with us. Uh, it's not really a competitive differentiator, but uh, it's just what what I think is are uh, is a good it's a good thing about a company that's agile. Okay, let's move on to our next question. How do you gather and link your various data sources? Is this done in Exabeam or another tool? So, how do you gather and link the tools together? Uh, so it's done in Exabeam, yes. Uh, we, so what we do is we gather all of the all of the artifacts from your sim. So we think about it this way: sim is amazing in gathering in gathering all of the logs. The sim the sim today the job its job is essentially to log as much as possible and to and to let you uh, dig into the data as quick as possible. What we do is essentially we provide the brain on top of sim. So providing all of the technology by, by looking at all of the artifacts that have been collected by the SIM and, and essentially putting value on your investment. Uh, that being said, I mean, you know, we do have uh, cases where 
uh, some products uh, or some feeds are not collected by a sim. Different companies have different uh, different concepts, such as you know what I, I, this is a chatty log. I don't want to send it to my sim because I pay a heck of a license on every gigabyte of data that I keep in it. We see it all the time. So you can do things like send us directly through syslog as well, but uh, and then we'll be the repository. But eventually, once you've gathered all of that information. What uh, we then digest it and understand and build the connection graph by all of the data, by all of the uh, different points and and uh, and possible vectors, to build a timeline to understand the logic, and then you know we have our our uh, our research teams that then uh, that then understand uh, or, or what can we do with it, what kind of 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 data can we gather? So there's a there's a security analytics team in our company that then just exactly that when you give me a new feed and I need to, to tie it into everything else they'll check what's the relevant signals what's the relevant uh, uh, models that, that apply here what's a risk in this log it's not trivial right if you look at an email log what's a risk in it how do I know what's risk how do I how do I remove uh, the the noise out of all of the out of all of the signals and then there's the research team uh, um, which uh, is Mighty, which what we do is we look into all of these like uh, big stories, like a, what's a Snowden? How does a Snowden look like? What's ransomware? All of that stuff, and, and figuring out right. So what can we do with with uh, machine learning and data science in order to to solve problems for big customers, etc. Um, that's it. Okay. Um, next question: Are security teams able to develop custom rules or use cases? Additionally, can you adjust vendor rule set? Uh, yes and yes. Uh, so our team is very open. Uh, uh, it's a platform. We provide our own content. Think about it as the expert content that comes from us by doing all of the research. But we have customers that, you know, uh, credit card companies, it's very common for them to have really good data science teams. Um, or uh, some teams have like really good security folks in them that, that, uh, that really understand the problem. And they write their own security rules and models. A lot of the times they come to us to, like, uh, as an initial point, to say, uh, "I have this idea. Can you help me think the way that you think?" And then we write it together. That's something we do. Sometimes they say, "I want to bring value to this thing. I think this is a problem. Can you guys investigate?" And the third option is, "I want to build my own rules and models." And then what they do is they go through training. Uh, even though it's pretty intuitive, but you know, when you when you want to take a security guy and you want to then teach teach that person um, how to apply uh, 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 mathematical algorithms in order to to get something out of it, so then sometimes you want to go through some training. And we do definitely provide that as well. Uh, so bottom line, platform is open. It comes out of the box with our own logic that you can alter if you want to, or you can create your own. OK, um, here's another one. Can Exabeam cause a performance impact on the customer sim? Uh, so no, it's a, we're okay. essentially querying. We're using it. We're using the the APIs that the vendors themselves are are uh, are providing. We, let's just say we we haven't seen any case till date that that happened simply because we're just like another user that queries on the on the on the sim. Um, yeah. Okay, there were, this is a two-part question. So the second part is also, does Exabeam have any capability to determine file share access for unstructured or structured data? Yes, absolutely. So we do that in two ways. We either look, we either uh, integrate with like uh, you know uh, detection products. Like you, you can look at things like Veronis and and other things that uh, other vendors that do that, and then we'll we'll just take their signals and and apply the the, the data science on top of it to make it more meaningful. Or the other side is that we we do look at all of the artifacts that are being generated by, by uh, you know uh, just the, the activity on the domain and the activity on the hosts that determine uh, file file access and file activity, uh, and then we can model it and say different things like for example uh, I see that you're taking files uh, from a folder that you never took before or you you're accessing a file that is on a permission that is not your permission that's more of a federal case but like you know the the, the the layers of, of security of uh, can I touch a, a security cl cl clearance above me or not? So we do all of that stuff, of course. And then there's there's stuff like uh, cloud cloud uh, file access, which is a bit uh, more exotic, uh, where we either connect connect and gather logs ourselves, or we uh, if you have a Casby uh, solution, then we'll connect and gather stuff from the Casby solution, and we'll model that as well. Uh, things like uh, 
and that's really important when you like share things with part with your different partners like contracts etc using some kind of an online platform and you want to make sure that they're only accessing what they should or if if they've been a long time partner they don't change the pattern of activity etc um, I, I hope that answers the question if not um, you are encouraged to ask uh, more details for it okay next question is there a preferred sim vendor Curator, yeah. Splunk, Logarithm? <laughs> Barry, did we lose you? Uh, you didn't lose me. Hello? Okay. No? Okay. Yeah, you didn't lose me. The answer was no. Okay. <laughs> um, next question. How do you adjust for a user adjusting their IP address through v VPN services? Uh, can you repeat the question? How do you adjust for a user adjusting their IP address through VPN services? Uh, we have a mechanism uh, nicely patented to track uh, user uh, user IP changes. Uh, we have mechanisms that, I'm, and I'm. Ha this is one of those things. Again, I don't want to discuss that on a public webinar. More than happy to discuss it in a meeting in a in a closed room and explain how it works. Uh, but essentially, we have the ability to track IP changes to hosts. Uh, over sessions, either it's VPN or not. I mean, even within your network, uh, it's it's not uncommon for a user to be to be required to VPN into the point of sale or the the PCI network or a, a special clear, clear, clearance network before they can do something there. And there are a lot of IP changes that can happen or or uh, host name changes that can happen during the during the this activity. Uh, so I can't answer the how, unfortunately, on a public webinar, but we're happy to take a meeting and explain it. Okay. Thanks, Barry. It looks like we've covered all of our questions. Is there anything else you want to cover before we wrap up? Uh, not really. I mean, I guess, I mean, everybody's welcome to, uh, you know, to talk to, to our guys and, and watch them. I think, I think when I, when I explained the, the, the premise of the problems we're solving, it's one thing, but when you get to see the, how easy it is to, to see value, it's something completely different. Um, you know, in, 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 in SOC today, in, 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 uh, in uh, SOC centers, one of the biggest things that I see everywhere, and it, it, it's an HR problem, really. It's not a security problem. Everything that I talked to over the past, uh, I guess, year or two, always said the same thing. I can't hire enough. I can't hire the right people or, or enough people because it's a... able to see something different because what we're saying is focus the, the people you have are good and they're there for a reason and what we want to do on, is to make sure that they are enabled so by giving them the right tools that take away a lot of the, dig, the the initial digging that they have to do and providing them with the tools to make things uh, faster by 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 taking away all of the guesswork by taking away the uh, quote unquote experience that might mean that they, if they haven't seen something before, they will never be able to see it unless they're they ju they're just lucky. Um, so by doing that, I think I think you, you gain a bit more. And I think each I mean everyone on this on this webinar is more than welcome to talk to your to your like rep that can talk to you, or, or the XBM rep, and just even just spend a few minutes just watch like a quick demo. Uh, that should give you more than enough to to think: Is this good for me, or this is this the right approach for me, or maybe not? Maybe my team is a is a team of ninjas, and every dollar I spend on technology is, is meaningless. So you know, it goes both ways. But that's kind of that's yeah, that's all I have. Okay. Um, Great. So thank you, everyone. We appreciate you for being here. So what's next? A number of you have um, sent in a question asking for the recording. We will be sending that out. So look for an email from us in the next 48 hours with a link to that archive recording, as well as um, the presentation deck. We also encourage you to check out additional resources like white papers, case studies, and videos in our library located at exabeam.com forward slash library. If you are ready to see our product in action, like Barry mentioned, please visit us at exabeam.com forward slash products forward slash demo. Thanks again for joining us, and we look forward to hearing from you soon.